Well, welcome back everybody to the, to the conference. This panel is, well, let me introduce myself. I'm Bernard Hockman. I'm at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced uh, Studies at the EUI dealing with global economic issues. We have a great panel uh, lined up and I think we also have a very interesting topic, um, the promises and the pitfalls of connectivity. And indeed, we have a number of major initiatives ongoing with different kind of groups of countries uh, and kind of focusing on this connectivity agenda. And we're going to have three speakers looking at each of these different initiatives that are ongoing. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Professor Marie Soderberg, who is at the European Institute of Japanese Studies <clears throat> and who is chairing the European Japan Advanced Research Network. Um, and I think we'll just turn the floor over to Marie and then we'll go through each of the speakers uh, and then we open it up to the discussant and then we take it from there. So Marie, the floor is yours. You need to unmute yourself. That's better now, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to take part in this panel and in this project. I think it's highly relevant and very much timely. I'm happy to be here and surrounded by such good scholars, <laughs> whom I know some of them at least. Uh, my part, the paper I've been writing is on the partnership of sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure which was agreed between EU and Japan in uh, 2019, in September. Um, what we can say about this one, it's below the uh, strategic partnership agreement, which is a legally binding one. Uh, then they agreed on this uh, partnership on sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure as well. It's a kind of combination of uh, European uh, favorite buzzwords, sustainable connectivity, and Japanese bus buzzwords, which is um, quality infrastructure. And they are merging together and uh, they are trying to implement this partnership now. And what I would say, uh, is different and what I will try to uh, prove in my paper, what is different this time from all the other agreements we've had between EU Japan during the years, uh, like the action plan and the Hague agreement and also strategic partnership in agree agreement in general is that this one is taking a systemic approach. And I'm going to go a little bit on the ground to see what is really happening between EU and Japan on the ground, which might not be visible in media or other places. Uh, why was this partnership concluded? I think this has been, it's part of the strategic partnership agreement and we have covered this in most of the other sessions here. Uh, one driving force is, so I will be very, very short on this one. One driving force was of course, uh, is of course China's rise. Uh, it is an answer to the Belt and Road Initiative in, in a sense, even if it's not written in the agreement, which uh, Watanabe-san will talk more about in a minute. Uh, it's also, the decline of liberalism all over the world. And we had the Trump government in the US for four years, which actually made EU and Japan conclude both the economic and the strategic partnership agreement. And we realized that we have to do something ourselves if we want to be sure to protect the liberal world order and so forth. And the result of this is this, uh, partnership on connectivity and infrastructure. Uh, to broadly outline what it's all about, I would say that there are mainly four fields. One is uh, the top one. Um, above all, I mean, 
the partnership, transparent uh, procurement practices, the ensuring of sustainability and high standards of economic, fiscal, financial, social and environmental sustainability is to go through all uh, what is done in this agreement. So uh, the agreement is in no way uh, neutral, it's highly value-based. So this should go through all the projects being done. Uh, the four areas where it's divided into, one is transport, uh, diversified trade and travel routes, linking uh, existing and future transport networks. Uh, what in Japan is talked about as quality infrastructure goes mainly into this one. Uh, strategic investments in critical infrastructure creates economic and political independences, interdependencies, both hard and soft ones. So that is one of the purpose with the infrastructure development. And we all know that infrastructure development is really highly needed in Asia, as well as other places in the world. Uh, I also uh, want to like uh, Mr. Kitaoka did yesterday emphasis the developing world where EU and Japan can work together in the future. It's not only the Indo-Pacific, but other places as well. And uh, the agreement is actually meant to encourage projects in third countries. So infrastructure is one area where it's needed, not only in Asia, but all over the world, in Africa and in uh, Latin America or part of Europe as well, Eastern Europe, Central Asia and so forth. So this is the main thing and also the one that the Japanese side might want to emphasize because this is where they have been working in East Asia for many years very successfully with their development programs. Uh, it, the second one is energy platforms and um, that are interconnected regionally. This is one of the purpose of this agreement. Modern energy systems and environmental friendly solutions they should all have. Uh, third area is digital technology, increased access to digital service while maintaining a high level of protection of consumer and personal data. I think, Akiko, this is your field, so I will not go too deep into that during my talk. And the fourth one is human dimension, advanced cooperation in education, research, innovation, culture, and tourism. This has been, of course, very difficult during the COVID 19 period, where we are not allowed to travel as we used to do. Uh, but I think COVID has also had some advantages for this agreement. Main, one is that there is actually financial resources available nowadays due to the huge budgets within the EU and even in Japan. So there should be possibilities to do something together as well. Uh, again, Kitaoka mentioned yesterday that Japan had uh, given 100 hospitals to developing countries to combat COVID. This is a real thing, I would say, uh, which actually EU and Japan could have done together, according to my view, and raised the flag for another type of assistance to developing countries. This has to do, um, to inform you, my favorite topic in, in researching on Japan is about development cooperation. And here we have had big changes since the Millennium Development Goals and then turning into the Sustainable Development Goals, which are much, much broader and actually more in line with what Japan has been doing in the field of development cooperation for many, many years. A lot of the infrastructure in Southeast Asia was financed by Japanese development cooperation money. Uh, and I think this will, EU was at that time rather critical, but now 
turned into a promoter of the same time type of OGA to a large extent. So uh, what has been done then to implement this agreement? I'd like to mention a few things here. Uh, for one thing, EU has created a support facility uh, to try to promote cooperation in political, strategic and development field with Japan. Uh, there were, have been five, nine webinars uh, or, uh, with uh, Japanese and European speakers. And what they are, it's also this project financed by Japan Foundation. I would say that's part of a way of connecting EU and Japan. Um, there is also a, a joint study on connectivity cooperation, which has been decided by by uh, by the, this uh, facility who supports the cooperation. And this study uh, is uh, going to work on Western Balkan. Eastern Europe and Central Asia. They have chosen specific countries. In Western Balkan, there will be Serbia, Bosnia, Albania. In Eastern Europe, Azerbaijan and Ukraine, and Central Asia, Uzbekistan. And in all of these countries, there is a mixed team with European and Japanese researchers going together asking all the people at home uh, what are the things they want to promote in those countries, uh, both in the EU and in Japan, and also now uh, going to the countries, asking what are your needs, what can we do for you? The thing was they should have gone out, COVID came in between, so now they have to collect that information uh, through other sources, or, uh, through uh, the web and also with people on the ground, trying to find projects where they can cooperate. It's actually very, very strategic. <laughs> and moving forward, uh, this uh, work will end with a report that we will get at the end of May this year. And then we will see what kind of projects they propose. Us. Already now we can say very shortly that there are differences. Um, According to the people of the report, uh, Japan is more towards concrete projects. EU likes to work on a regional level much more. And there is also problems with the financing and the regulation of the financing because we have different ways of doing this. So these are issues that must be solved to advance forward. Uh, together with this, um, agreement when it, the partnership on connectivity and infrastructure when it was signed there was also a number of agreements so uh, European banks are now connected with all the Japanese banks like JIBIC like JICA also for that sense and other banks so there are good good connections here um, yes and there's also a lot of talk we have a new connectivity agreement probably between India and Europe in May. And there is already discussion going on on what kind of connectivity projects that the EU and Japan can cooperate on in India. So there's gonna be more on this one. Mm -hmm. Why they chose the Western Balkans? Probably because this was a priority area where, where uh, Prime Minister Abe had a, a Western Balkan initiative in 2018 and Japan and Europe also have a Western Balkan initiative. It was also partly an answer to the Chinese Central and Eastern initiative, uh, the 17 plus one so-called, which had been going on for a long time. Uh, so this was an answer to that. And what one can say in the field of development cooperation also is now I will have a, a box full of projects that have been done together by EU and Japan at the end of my paper. And it's too long actually to read it out here. If I did that, it would take my 10 minutes. <laughs> so I think I should rather finish here and say that uh, there is more on the groundwork this time to really make a difference. And uh, 
I think there are going to be a difference in EU-Japan cooperation in the future in connectivity and infrastructure development, which is value-based and very much needed at the moment. I will finish there. Great, thanks a lot for kicking us off. Um, I think the next topic is going to be focused on what you already mentioned as kind of one of the drivers of what we're seeing, and which is very much the elephant in the room, which is, of course, China and the Belt and Road Initiative. So Professor uh, Shino Watanabe is going to be speaking on that topic. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, want to show you my PowerPoint. And uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you and we can see the slides. So all good. Ah, excellent. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this um, distinguished uh, conference and panel today. And my name is Shino, Shino Watanabe. And I'm going to talk about the Belt Road Initiative challenges and opportunities for EU-Japan cooperation. Uh, this is a very important topic, but uh, because this time I have only 10 minutes, so I just want to focus on uh, China's overseas development finance. As you know, uh, it has passed more than seven years since China launched uh, BRI in 2013, and China has contributed to developing infrastructure in BRI countries and enhanced its connectivity with and within the Indo-Pacific region and between Asia and Europe and beyond. And uh, China's increasing active engagement has posed new challenges to the international society. So from a somewhat micro perspective, but I'm going to focus on challenges uh, caused by China um, as a kind of a example of a pitfall of BRI. So today I just uh, focus on three uh, points and uh, China's uh, BRI initiative amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenges of uh, China's overseas finance and some kind of areas for uh, EU-Japan uh, cooperation. So China's BRI is uh, now at the turning point. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, restricted the movement of Chinese workers. According to the statistics of the uh, Ministry of Commerce in China, the number of Chinese workers uh, dispatched for labor services overseas uh, significantly dropped uh, almost by 40% uh, from the figure in uh, last year. So it's a kind of a huge drop. And at the same time, uh, local uh, governments in developing countries also faced difficulty in continuing the project because they had to allocate uh, their budget to fight against the pandemic. So traditional uh, infrastructure projects uh, overseas, such as a kind of a, a construction of railroads, airports, and seaports, and so on, have been reportedly suspended because these projects had been mainly conducted by Chinese workers. And the COVID-19 pandemic decreased the number of newly signed contracts and delayed the completion of Chinese projects. As you can see the graph on your right side. Of course, uh, you know that Chinese infrastructure projects overseas have been mainly uh, funded by China. Uh, more uh, concretely, uh, Chinese policy banks, uh, mainly two policy banks called China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank. The problem is no one knows how much China owes to the entire world. Perhaps even China itself doesn't have a very clear idea. So uh, last December, a very useful data set of Chinese uh, overseas development finance was released uh, by the 
Global Development Policy Center of Boston University in the US. According to the data set, uh, from 2008 to 2019, uh, China Development Bank and China Exim Bank extended 858 loans to uh, foreign countries, and the total amount reached 462 billion US dollars. Interestingly, this amount is almost equivalent to the loans um, the World Bank had extended during the same period. So now we can say China is the world's largest official creditor. So, but um, more importantly, we should note that uh, China's overseas uh, lending has become less and less transparent uh, due to the shift in funding modalities. Uh, China has shifted funding modalities mainly from overseas, overseas lending by two uh, policy banks to commercial lending by Chinese major commercial banks and also project financing. Uh, this chart on your right side shows the amount of loans uh, Chinese policy banks offered and also the number of projects. As you can see, two uh, bank loans peaked out in 2016 and after that dropped significantly. So China has begun to be reluctant to extend loans of CD, uh, China Development Bank and also China Exim Bank since 2017. So it means uh, China is now using more private funds. And please take a look at the graph on your right side. This graph shows AIIB's approved loans, Asia Infrastructure Invest Bank. AIIB's approved loans have significantly increased, particularly uh, from uh, 2017. And you, you should know, we should note the huge hike in last year in 2020. So China recently uses various means to implement BRI project in developing countries in cooperation with the private sector. So now, because um, time is limited, I just uh, want to briefly elaborate uh, this point in the context of Europe, uh, focusing on uh, Central and Eastern European countries. As you know, China has been making a lot of investment in the region. And the question is where money comes from? Uh, because AIIB, Asia Infrastructure Invest Bank, has not extended loan to Central and Eastern European countries yet. So this chart shows China's overseas lending by Chinese Development Bank, as well as China Exim Bank to Central and East Asia, East, Eastern European countries. And the Chinese, two Chinese policy banks have founded only 12 projects from 2009 to 2019, only to four countries, as you can see, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Hungary, Montenegro, as well as uh, Serbia. And obviously, uh, more than 12 projects have been carried out by Chinese companies in the region. So these projects are likely founded by other means, perhaps commercial lending and also project financing. And uh, more frequent use of private lending and project financing is a challenge because it only funds a project that can generate enough cash flow for long-term payment. So in other words, uh, important and necessary infrastructure might not be carried out because of the lack of funding. And increasing use of project financing makes it more difficult for developing countries and also the global donor community as a whole to grasp the total volume of credit Chinese companies extend to developing countries. So project finance is a very long-term scheme and generally taking like 30 to 40 or 50 years. So if Chinese companies cannot recover their investment in the long run, they will not transfer facilities to developing countries. So in the end, China may end up owing many, many facilities overseas. And the Chinese ownership of strategic infrastructure in developing countries 
might raise security concerns all over the world. So if countries are getting asymmetrically economic interdependent on China, then China might weaponize their over-dependence if China wants to. So the question is what we should do. And uh, I believe the free and open in the Pacific FOIP is an ideal framework for enhancing cooperation among EU and Japan, not only in the security domain, but also in the economic domain. Having said that, uh, my, in my observation, one of the weaknesses of FOIP is uh, still idea driven and uh, it lacks concrete projects. In contrast, as you know, China's BRI is more project based and with tangible outcomes. So in terms of international development finance, uh, we can make use of the existing institutions to promote further cooperation uh, between Japan and EU, such as G7, G20, and the Paris Club, OECD, to address financial challenges uh, caused by China. And uh, let me add a few words on what has been doing uh, by the global donor community uh, before ending my presentation. One big achievement is the debt service suspension initiative amid the COVID-19 pandemic. It was proposed at the G20 meeting last May and the G20 members decide to freeze their official bilateral debt payments until the end of last year, but later it was extended to the end of this June in 2021. And I think that the deadline will be also extended in the near future, perhaps by the end of this year. In any case, uh, this uh, DSSI is a very interesting case because China also joined it. Uh, because China is a G20 member, and it suggests that um, sometimes it might be useful for us to include China in the same framework with us. Of course, um, it's not always the case. So actually, this is the first time China joined this kind of international debt architecture. But China needs to be a full-fledged partner of the scheme, not just the existing name. At this moment, DSSI only covers official lending. It is not mandatory for private creditors to join the DSSI. So the global community must find a way to incorporate private creditors into the DSSI. At the same time, what's more important is China has not classified its policy banks as official lenders. In other words, uh, from the Chinese perspective, uh, Chinese Development Bank and also China Exim Bank are both private uh, you know, lending, private lenders. That's the current uh, view of China. So we need to come up with an idea how to incorporate both Chinese policy banks as well as uh, private creditors, not only Chinese, but also other countries, private creditors into this kind of framework. So I'm fully aware it's extremely difficult to change uh, Chinese behavior. And uh, we need to another panel, maybe or even another conference to discuss how to change Chinese behavior in a constructive manner and under which circumstances we can change Chinese behavior. But um, I would argue at least uh, several factors uh, we need to take into account. First is timing. In other words, timing matters. So China continue to pay close attention to reactions and criticism from foreign countries. At this moment, President Xi Jinping is fully aware China faces a very difficult political environment, partly because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So when China perceives it's a Chinese national interest to change its own behavior, China does change it. Sometimes foreign pressure is uh, counterproductive, so we have to take somewhat nuanced approach. And second, China is very good at using divide and conquer tactics. So when EU and Japan, and hopefully the United States as well, work together and uh, present common front against China, uh, China is less likely to drive a wedge uh, between us. And lastly, the third point, uh, I think issues matter. In other words, uh, in general, China can cooperate with us in some issues like economy, finance, 
and the environment, and China is not willing to cooperate uh, in other issues like uh, national traditional security, human rights, Hong Kong, Taiwan, among others. So we should know the most important thing for China is to maintain the Chinese Communist Party's rule and predominance in China. In other words, when Chinese leaders apprehend the regime stability or some other issues, they might make a compromise. So in conclusion, now is the time for EU and Japan to show solidarity against China in issues we share the same common interest. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. And I'm sure we're going to come back to a number of these themes like you touched upon in particular, what the EU and Japan can do to actually, on the one hand, take on China in, in, in the way you put it, but on the other hand, I think also help China, right? Because as you kind of illustrated with the data that we have now on the BRI and what is going on in terms of the financial sustainability of a lot of those projects, you know, it's clear that there is quite a lot to be done that actually this debt service uh, suspension approach is, is clearly one element of that. But I think much more generally, there is a real need, and I think we'll come back to this in the discussion, to kind of connect these, these various initiatives together and actually try and help improve at the end of the day, what matters, which is from an, I'm an economist, right? So, so it's really trying to improve what actually happens on the ground in the countries, in the recipient countries. So our next speaker is going to uh, go into an even more complicated topic, <laughs> which relates to the digital connectivity and uh, agenda. So Dr. Akiko, um, Fukushima, who is at the uh, Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research, is going to present the idea she has in her paper uh, on this topic. Thank Dr. you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Heckman and EUI for this opportunity to join the conversation today. The COVID-19 has accelerated our dependence on digitalization. While the digital means have allowed us to continue our life, work, and pleasure, it has simultaneously expanded digital risks at home and globally during the pandemic. Today, in my initial remark, I would like to begin with commonalities of Japan and EU's approach to a digital age. Then I will focus on digital connectivity through brief case studies on data flow, subsea cable networks, and 5G, and conclude. Now, first point, both Japan and EU have placed priorities on digital. Japan plans to create an agency dedicated to digital transformation this fall. In the diet policy speech in January 2021, Prime Minister Suga said that he sets aside 1 trillion yen, approximately 8 billion euro, to digital transformation from administrative procedures to education and provides tax incentives to private companies for their digital development. Prime Minister Suga stated that Japan will aim to be a front runner in digital by advancing research and development across the public and private sectors, and also by leading global rulemaking on telecommunication standards. In fact, Japan has launched Society 5.0 in 2018, which goes beyond information society and uses digital data processed by artificial intelligence, AI, aiming at human-centered society. I observe commonalities between EU and Japanese policies on digital. President von der Leyen of the European Commission in her State of the Union in September 2020 stated that EU should lead the way on digital and should not follow way of others who are setting standards for us. 
Furthermore, on March 9th, 2021, the European Commission presented a vision and avenues for Europe's digital decade to 2030 entitled Digital Compass. I observe that Japan and EU want to lead rather than be led and take human-centered approaches to a digital age, which offers a platform for future cooperation backed by EPA, SPA and the Connectivity Agreement. This brings me to my second point, digital connectivity. The term is used to mean digital and data infrastructure that connects people and countries. Digital connectivity is the basis of a digital economy and it depends and includes an open, free, stable, accessible, interoperable, reliable and secure cyberspace. It includes policy and regulatory frameworks in my mind. Today, I will take up data flow, subsea cable networks and fifth generation mobile networks 5G in digital connectivity. I would like to note that uh, China advances in digital connectivity under the banner of Digital Silk Road DSR as a part of its BRI. It is argued that China aims at uh, introducing China standard technology to BRI countries so that BRI countries will insist on China standards to be adopted as global standards or to be on advantage in international negotiation of standards. Moreover, the new Chinese cybersecurity law in 2020 compels Chinese firms to surrender data to the government whenever requested. This possible data surveillance is a concern. Let me begin the case study from data flow. The engine for growth is fueled no longer by gasoline, but more and more by data. Data such as medical, industrial, traffic, and other uh, most useful non-personal anonymous data should flow beyond borders. However, personal data, data embodying intellectual property, national security intelligence, and so on should be carefully protected. As uh, Dr. Okano Hegemans argued, countries have taken diverging approaches to uh, govern the cross-border movement of data, which even hampers the interoperability of systems. Legislative frameworks for data governance need to calculate the trade-offs of privacy, business interests, and security interests. The US places priorities on business interest and emphasizes data free flow. China, on the other hand, prioritizes state security. Meanwhile, the EU has introduced general data protection regulation and has an adequacy rules for data going out of the union. Japan has introduced APPI, the Act on Protection of Personal Information. As the case of uh, Line Corporation, a messaging uh, application provider revealed last week, Japan needs to scrutinize further on personal data protection. Former Prime Minister Abe proposed data free flow with trust, DFFT, which was endorsed at the sidelines of G20 Osaka summit in June 2019 by Japan, EU, US, China, and 21 states. This convergence attempted for data governance should further be discussed at the WTO and other uh, fora. Yuval Noor Harari cautions the danger caused by the data flow. He says, a large scale of surveillance by digitalization threatens our privacy and can open a way to, for unprecedented authoritarianism. The challenge is to find optimum equilibrium for data flow between economic growth and privacy protection. This brings me to the second case study on subsea cable networks in digital connectivity. Subsea cables carry over 95% of international data flow. Thus, it is called the world's information superhighway. In the world market as of 2020, share of China is still 10%, but it's growing. The concern expressed is the mana China markets its subsea cables. 
China urges recipients of its aid to purchase not only subsea cables, but also landing stations, 5C cell phones, conversation applications by WeChat, or cashless payment systems such as Alipay. In addition, China can monitor people in BRI countries through their systems. We ought to consider quality digital ODA with proper funding and its rules on technical and capacity building assistance. Closely related this, to this uh, subsea cable uh, issue is networks, particularly 5G. The US under President Trump urged its allies and partners to exclude Huawei uh, from respective markets. In January 2020, the European Commission recommended member states to avoid dependency on suppliers considered to be high risk. Each member state responded in a varied manner from an all out ban to restricted ban. ban. In the Netherlands, according to the Kringendal Institute's Foreign Affairs Barometer Survey in December 2020, over 41% of people in the Nether Netherlands surveyed responded that they would like to have a Chinese phone, although 43% said no to Chinese network infrastructure. The Dutch government has decided that the build out of 5G networks should include comprehensive security and supervision of network equip equipment. Similarly, the Japanese government has not banned technology by any specific country or vendor and encourages businesses to develop new technology and applications with uh, tax incentives. In June 2020, NTT and NEC have unveiled an alliance to develop equipment for 5G base stations in compliance with Open Radio Access Network, ORAN, and to cooperate on high quality and low cost information technology products. Global coalitions are effective for establishing international standards through a multi-vendor approach. We should avoid dual standards. In November 2019, Japan, Australia, and US have announced the Brew Dot Network, a multi-stakeholder initiative that brings together governments, the prime private sector, and civil society to promote high quality trusted standards for global infrastructure development in an open and inclusive framework. This initiative combined with private sector alliances on development of 5G and beyond, including Oran, may avoid vendor locking and the move for liberal cooperation. In closing, brief analysis on digital connectivity reveal complex challenges we face. Businesses and research and development must spare head advances to avoid single vendor locking. Governments must also be swift ahead of the trend up in front to achieve convergence rather than divergence of global governance regime or regulations for the sake of interoperability of the systems for digital connectivity, calculating the trade-offs among human security, business interests, and national security. I hope EU and Japan, with commonalities in their approaches to a digital age, as was pointed out by Dr. Letta yesterday in the opening session, will further strive to promote liberal cooperation be fitted to a digital age backed by agreements in place. The topic, as was pointed out by the chair, is very complicated and goes beyond my uh, full comprehension. Thus, I look forward to learning from comments and discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that um, for that presentation. I think some of the things you've touched on kind of complement the BRI uh, worries with respect to financial sustainability towards you know what are the effects of some of the linkage potential lock-in strategies. But I think you also highlighted the fact that we don't necessarily live on the same planet when it comes to how we deal with things like cross-border data flows, right? So we have the EU approach, we have the US, you know, let it all go. And we have the effort to try and kind of build a bridge between the two in, in terms of this data free flow with, with trust. 
I think one of the things you mentioned, which I think we'll also come back to, is to what extent international kind of institutions can actually help address some of these tensions. And in particular, you mentioned the WTO uh, negotiations that are ongoing. And I think you know the, the whole procurement agenda also is something, of course, that could fit into a WTO uh, umbrella. So we have an excellent discussant to uh, kind of um, reflect on all three of the papers. Uh, Dr. Maika Okano Heimans from uh, the Klingendal um, Institute. So it's now over to you. So about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll come back to the speakers, please. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, a real honor to uh, to be reflecting on these uh, three excellent presentations, uh, three um, researchers that I uh, value highly um, in, in their very long um, academic career and all the work that they've uh, done contributing to these important topics and to EU-Japan relations. Um, so I wanted to thank EUI for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to reflect. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see how we've sort of come full circle uh, when uh, Marie started out by saying that um, this uh, uh, connectivity partnership that the EU and Japan uh, concluded in 2019 was very much values driven um, and it was very much uh, pushed by the in geopolitical context in which uh, the EU and Japan found itself both uh, struggling um, to find a good way to deal with um, an, an, a less reliable transatlantic in our case, and of course, um, the alliance partner uh, for Japan. Uh, so how to deal with the United States. Um, and then uh, values uh, drove this partnership. Sustainability was then very much at the forefront. Um, and now, um, of course, uh, Professor Fukushima ended her um, introduction by ending with this human-centered approach that the EU and Japan are now pushing forward. Um, especially in the field of digital connectivity. Um, and this is, is really remarkable, I think, because this is one thing where really the EU and Japan stand out and where they, um, where they differ somewhat from their big peer, the United States, um, which we are both now, of course, trying to establish, uh, re-establish ties with, um, uh, with the incoming Biden administration. So it's, it's a very important moment, I think, to be discussing what the EU and Japan can still do together, um, even as the United States is, is returning to uh, multilateralism, is also willing, again, uh, to work with partners um, rather than to antagonize uh, its own partners, um, and to see what it is exactly um, that we can still offer um, to the many countries out there, both in the Indo-Pacific, in Japan's backyard, um, and in the, um, the European neighborhood, because that's how I see really where I think the, uh, the, the, the five regions that were identified in this connectivity partnerships, they were basically Europe's backyard. So um, Marie mentioned some of them, uh, the Western Balkans, Eastern European countries, Central Asia and Africa. Um, and of course, that other um, uh, region, uh, Japan's backyards now labeled the Indo-Pacific. And, and I should again like to emphasize that J Japan really pulled the EU into this discussion about the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this connectivity partnership was the first document where the EU officially recognized or, or um, well, referenced this term. And that was, I think, a, a very big moment um, because the Indo-Pacific is, of course, um, it's not just about a region, it's a very geopolitical uh, concept that is also responding to the rise of China, just as uh, connectivity in itself is. Um, and of course, as we are all eagerly awaiting uh, the, EO, uh, the EU's Indo-Pacific strategic approach that will be uh, out uh, hopefully next uh, month, um, well, we'll see if we can move uh, to, to a next step. Um, so sustainability and the human-centered uh, are really, I think, values where, where the EU and Japan uh, share a little bit more with one another than they probably share with the United States. Um, of course, on environmental sustainability, um, the US has very much been a laggard, whereas the EU and Japan have been very much pushing this um, in their development cooperation, in their, the, the projects that they finance uh, through development uh, projects. Um, and um, the human-centered approach is also uh, different from uh, not just the Chinese approach, but also the American approach, um, because it's sometimes said, you know, the, 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 the Chinese, of course, they favor in digital uh, domain uh, state security. 
um, which is of course not what the EU or the United States um, or Japan wants to prioritize. Um, but also we do not in the EU and Japan prioritize businesses interests in the way that the United States has. So I think this, this human-centered approach is also a, a very interesting concept to be discussing um, what really unites the EU and Japan um, and uh, what we can do again in third countries also to provide an alternative to what China is doing in third regions um, as well as to some of what uh, the United States is doing. And of course I think both of us want to work with the United States. So rather than offering an alternative to what the United States is doing, is trying to get the United States back on board with this human-centered approach. Um, and fortunately, President Biden has, has clearly emphasized uh, the environment in, um, in appointing, of course, uh, Mr. Kerry as a special envoy, and, and we see Paris agreement. So there's definitely opportunities there. Um, but also the human-centered approach to digital connectivity. I think we see new um, well, potential uh, for the EU and Japan with the United States to cooperate, because also in the United States, of course, they saw the Capitol Hill riots and they saw the problematic uh, aspects um, that, um, well, the, the, the digital platforms um, can also bring to society um, as they uh, have, a, have a very much unregulated um, uh, access now to, um, to, to people. So putting people back in center stage rather than businesses or the state. I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. And I'm, I'm very happy that, um, that Professor Fukushima uh, pointed out to this. Um, what, I, what I thought was also interesting, so it's, it's a really well-designed panel, I must say. Um, the EU and Japan have, of course, been champions in, in development assistance and in, in development finance. Despite the differences between them, uh, we've both been, been champions. Um, and, um, and we are now in, 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 in recent years, or perhaps not so recent anymore, <laughs> for a decade or so, already challenged in very different ways by this new big actor, China. And I think the, the EU is more fundamentally challenged in, in the way that we have been doing development cooperation, um, not emphasizing so much uh, the infrastructure domain, uh, but emphasizing social, uh, basic human needs and the social elements. Um, and Japan has been emphasized, has been challenged, of course, because it was China that was most active in its own region. Um, and I would really be interested to hear from Professor uh, Watanabe um, how she sees this difference between the two actors now playing out also as the EU and Japan try to coordinate um, their responses to the, uh, China as a growing actor in, the, um, in, in, in development finance. Um, because, as Marie said, um, sort of the EU is moving closer, I think, to, to the Japanese approach. So we are realizing um, that it's not, uh, it shouldn't probably be uh, mostly about grants, if anything, because we don't lo no longer have the money for that. Um, but also loans um, may bring about better results in developing countries because they create more ownership um, of developing countries. Um, and uh, the EU, I think, uh, has been, uh, well, should be willing to learn from Japan in this front. At the same time, uh, what I hear back a lot uh, from when I talk to people in Brussels who are also implementing um, the, uh, the connect, trying to implement the connectivity agreement, is that, of course, JBIC is, is an extremely big animal uh, that is difficult um, to, to sort of engage with. So if you're looking for joint projects in third countries, uh, Marie, you mentioned that project you're working on. Um, I, I genuinely wonder what are the real, what is the real potential? Should we really be trying to, to sort of change those big animals or should we have, uh, is there really benefit also to, to coordinating and synergizing, knowing what the other is doing and rather than really trying to, to change one another, as we all know is, is extremely complex in, in a, in a relationship with a partner at home, you know, how could we then ever imagine that, um, you know, JPIC and, and JICA um, are going to get on board with the European approach um, or the other way around, of course, because the EU EIB has also its own way of doing. And I think the exchanges are, can, are, are extremely valuable. So over time, we will see some of that. Um, but if we're looking for shorter term results, and that is what we are looking at, um, I think, um, shouldn't we also be looking rather than at joint projects, at synergized projects and at more coordination? Um, and the same could be said, of course, of the, the, the topics that, uh, that Professor Fukushima um, uh, introduced of subsea cables. 
um, of, of 5G, because we all know that there's a huge need also in Indo-Pacific, but also in, in the EU's neighborhood um, for this hard, in, hard digital infrastructure. Um, and, you know, of course, we know that there's European companies, Nokia and Ericsson. Um, should we be pushing them, helping them to also go to those countries where where really the basics of broadband infrastructure uh, is still very much needed, um, at the same, as we are also trying to talk to them uh, about data regulation. Um, because, again, it's, it will be a little bit more costly. So, again, I guess a question to, to both Marie and to Akko is that how are we going to get the, the more, raise more, more funds to do this? Um, is it worth it uh, to, to really pour more uh, money into these uh, sort of projects, um, knowing that this will go at the expense of something else? And, and what could that be? So in that bigger context, I'd be really interested to hear uh, from both of you what can be done. Um, I should have a look at, uh, at the time. Um, perhaps a final question. Um, the, uh, the issue of issue-based problem solving areas. Um, Marie, you started out by saying, uh, Japan wants the more the practical uh, approach uh, is aiming for concrete projects with delivering real results. Uh, or as you said, uh, the EU is looking more for a regional approach. Um, that raises to me the question, who are the key actors in this EU uh, picture? Uh, because of course we know that the, the EU itself um, it's, it's very much involved with development institutions, it's very much involved in, in the WTO, where it can speak on behalf of the member states. Um, but of course, in many other international institutions, it, it is not. In the International Telecommunications Union, where we are now discussing uh, a, a sort of a new fundamentals for internet, um, or in the G20, the EU as such is not represented. So, so how to go about this? How does that impact the implementation of the connectivity agreement, um, both in, uh, well, in, in the projects that you were talking about, Marie, um, and um, the ones that you were talking about, um, uh, Professor Fukushima? I'd be really interested uh, to hear more about that. Um, on development finance, um, yes, I think that uh, the, uh, China's growing presence, as, as already said, um, is very much of a concern. Uh, there is, of course, also a group of people out there who are saying that, you know, that it's sort of an inconvenient truth, often ignored, is that the economic activities on, for example, the African continent of China are not so much worse than what the United States and what Europe have been doing themselves. Um, how do you engage with the people who say that? Um, and uh, of course, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, how do you en engage with uh, the, the fora where already this issue has been on the table? Um, you mentioned, of course, the OECD. Um, I, I do indeed think the Club of Paris is, is very much worth looking at um, because in those, um, in those settings, uh, as we know, China has been an observer in the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, also in the Paris Club, um, but it, it's not it has i think very made a, a sort of a conscious decision not to join um which put us in uh, all the others in a, in a sort of an uncomfortable position because chinese um officials are gaining benefits of reaping you know of, of getting a lot of information knowing what is out there and sort of choosing at their own uh, liking when and where what to share information about so if we're talking about transparency as an issue I think that is very much problematic, of course. Um, and what can really be done about this, um, other than, again, offering alternatives to the countries? Because that's, of course, another question that is oftentimes ignored. Why do these countries um, will willingly accept um, the, the loans or the project finance uh, for specific projects that the Chinese uh, uh, actors um, and are, are, uh, well, are offering? Um, and if it's really that much of a, an, an issue that's of importance to us, how can we make sure that our businesses also see value in offering counter proposals um, and where this is not, um, well, perhaps cannot be done on a market basis, uh, what can governments do to, to support them? Um, wouldn't that be a, 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 a sort of a more uh, likely road to success rather than you know, the, the circles that we've been talking in uh, in OECD and in, and in the Club of Paris, uh, trying to 
to change people's mind because as you, as you as you said yourself um china will cooperate with us on some fronts and not on others and it will also only do so when it feels it's in its own interests so is is there a way of of convincing chinese officials in this case that it is in its own interest or is that perhaps already happening um because we we of course all know that um also uh, well the 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 lower numbers of uh, of projects, uh, as you mentioned, um, that have been financed, is that also um, well? Can that can that also be explained by the fact that perhaps Chinese actors also have noted themselves that this is not a sustainable way to uh, development finance or to to productivity? Um, yeah, a final point that I thought um, might be interesting on, on ad hoc coalition based problem solving issues, the, the Quad, of course, we all read, I'm sure, the uh, the statements that the, the Quad countries that uh, where Japan is part of uh, have put out uh, last week, um, or was it already the week before? Um, and that was very much a shift towards really practical um, things that could be done, vaccine diplomacy, um, supply chains initiative, um, the Blue Dot Network, um, which you know, I don't really know where it stands today, so that maybe that's not the best uh, example of, of a really a problem-solving um, practical approach. Do you have any, any um, suggestions for what the EU and Japan can do under this very broad uh, connectivity partnership in the field of finance, in the field of digital connectivity? Uh, what, how can we make it that, that human-centered approach, that sustainable connectivity element, um, how we, can we translate that to, to practical uh, issues, uh, to problems that need to be solved in those regions that have been highlighted in the connectivity partnership? I'd really be curious for your response, because as you know, I've been working on these issues myself for, for quite some time now, and I've also been looking for, for those ideas myself. So I'd really um, love to hear from you on that front. Thank you. Great. So, great set of, of comments and questions to um, to the three authors. Um, in particular, the um, so I think also some specific questions to all of the panelists in terms of looking forward. Where do we go from here? And I think the two I really picked up was you know essentially focusing on what could be done to actually do more to coordinate, to collaborate, to kind of connect. We're talking about connectivity here, right? So we also, I think there might be a bit of a connectivity challenge um, between both the EU and, and Japan. But also what I picked up in, in, in the discussion is, in a sense, EU and Japan really are kind of much more aligned than China, but also than the United States. Because in a sense, you can say really what the, the Chinese model is one which very much relies on investments by companies. Yes, they're not necessarily private companies, but that's very much something that we also see the US doing. And if we think about the development cooperation dimension, which again was stressed as a commonality in a number of the papers and also by Micah just now, that is very much an area in which Japan and the EU lead, right? So you don't really see the United States doing anywhere near of what you know we do, uh, Japan and, and the EU do. So I think that really is, I, I know there's a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion in this conference on the US and the US is always out there, but I think this is very much an agenda where I would argue the United States really doesn't play uh, that big a role. So it really is EU, Japan, China. And I think that very much was made clear also in the presentations. So let's go back to uh, the three authors. And if you could each, you know, each have two, three minutes to respond to some of the questions and suggestions that were made by uh, Micah, then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers from the people who are listening in. So let's just start in the same order of the presentations. So let's start with Marie. Yes, uh, financing was one of the main issues uh, for development cooperation. And I, I think that, that we have different regulation and, and that GBIC is such a big organization. <laughs> How can we ever get anything out of there? Should not prevent us from actually cooperating. And there are several ways of doing this. Uh, like you said, Maike, we could also divide projects so that the EU take half of a project of a power plant or whatever and uh, uh, 
Japanese takes the road going to the power plant or the other way around. So we divide projects and work side by side. That's one way of doing it. On smaller projects, I think we can always cooperate. But we also need to raise more funds. I mean, um, the Chinese funds have been so huge. And one way of doing this is actually letting private companies in to finance infrastructure. It might be seen as a Chinese American approach or whatever, but I think it's going to be needed if we are to develop infrastructure in the world at large. So private companies has a role to play here to make sustainable solutions for the developing world. Practical approaches, I think finally EU after and Japan after a number of agreements on how we should cooperate is finally going down to the implementation stage where uh, practical approaches are needed and where we need to solve out how we can cooperate. And here I think the joint study, this happened to be in Eastern Europe, Western Balkan and Central Asia, but to have uh, European and Japanese experts going out together to the developing world, finding out what are the needs here, what can we do for you and how can it be done? That's one way of getting closer to to the ground on what is really needed. And I think that's one of the most important parts also to listen to the developing countries. What do they need? What can we do for you, so to say, rather than build something they are not interested in? Maybe I, I end here and come back again later. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, Professor Watanabe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maika-san, for so many uh, excellent questions. And um, here, I would like to answer some of them, but uh, it would be nice if we can continue discussion <laughs> in any way. Uh, as for the difference of uh, Chinese uh, aid and Japan's aid, I think uh, there are a couple of differences. Uh, from uh, Let's um, start with uh, Chinese foreign aid. Uh, China very much uh, emphasize win-win approach, win-win. In other words, uh, both uh, China and the recipient or developing countries uh, should win. So not uh, in a kind of a one-way activity from China to developing countries. So when China uh, offer assistance, even China try to think about what kind of merits you know, Chinese aid brings to China. That's a kind of big difference uh, from a Japanese one because uh, Japan thinks it's of course, it's a kind of aid, not like a business transaction. Of course, in the long run, it could be good if uh, Japan's aid uh, helps uh, improving the, their kind of, uh, you know, sentiment toward Japan and so forth. So uh, in the long run, but uh, Japan doesn't uh, uh, think it a kind of a short-term transaction. At the same time, Chinese foreign aid is top down uh, sometimes like uh, politics are like, um, you know, attached. Usually um, it's a, a big infrastructure project and there are two types. One is like, uh, let's say like a soccer stadium or kind of a big uh, infrastructure project that um, uh, people can enjoy. At the same time, uh, kind of a project, like in the case of the Hanban Tota, for instance, in Sri Lanka, like uh, their, you know, top political leaders can win the next, uh, you know, election. That kind of a uh, political uh, interest going on as well. So two types of uh, you know, big infrastructure project. At the same time, uh, those like um, Chinese aids usually, like, how can I say? Um, Usually it's a kind of a top down and it's not the way that, um, you know, a grassroots level request. But uh, Japanese uh, case, it's both. Of course, sometimes it could be top down, but mostly it's a kind of bottom up approach. And also Japan's uh, aid, uh, especially uh, respect ownership of the local community or like uh, developing uh, governments in developing countries. So it's kind of a, you know, different approach. At the same time, uh, Japan's uh, ODA or Japan's aid has some kind of disadvantages because it's kind of bottom up. It takes a long time. 
And of course, like, uh, it's a kind of a long procedure. So even if a developing country wants to get money, it takes usually like two years to get a disbursement. But when it comes to Chinese aid, because it's a top down, it's very quick, just a few months. And sometimes like a, a really, you know, few paperwork. So like for like local government officials, sometimes it's easy to get the money from China. Of course, they want to get money from Japan as well, but it takes so long. Then in the long run, you know, they kind of gave up. Uh, that kind of sad story that I sometimes hear. So like, uh, it's a totally different approach between Japan's and Chinese aid. At the same time, some like a uh, good, you know, elements that the Japan should learn from China, especially like, uh, those, like a simple procedure and a very swift uh, decision making. And as for the cooperation uh, between Japan and Europe in terms of, uh, you know, aid, uh, for instance, um, one good way is to, uh, like, let's say, think about the case in the Southeast Asian countries. As you know, FOIP is not necessarily a counter argument against BRI, some component definitely, but it's not entirely counter against the Chinese BRI. But unfortunately, uh, this message is not ne necessarily well received in like uh, countries in Southeast Asia. So in that sense, like, if Japan uh, push too much with Japan's own uh, aid. Sometimes like uh, countries are reluctant to receive it. But if like uh, European countries, EU or you know, and Japan can cooperate and uh, you know, to get work together and assist some kind of project, uh, it's kind of a good way to show our willingness to assist rather than the political message to counter against uh, China's BRI. So in that sense, like uh, there are so many ways that the European countries and Japan can cooperate. And especially, uh, Japan has some expertise uh, in like East Asia, for instance. But when it comes to Africa, uh, when it comes to like Central and Eastern European countries, of course, you know some experts out there in Japan. But our knowledge is so limited. So those areas, uh, European countries have long history of like research and also even some experience of like ruling some of the you know former colonies. So like so many things that we can share. So that's a kind of one idea when it comes to, you know, Japan, EU cooperation in like a foreign assistance. And as for the kind of, uh, you know, Chinese like uh, status as an observer in like the Club of Paris or even like a development assistance committee of OECD, I totally agree with the kind of concern raised by uh, Mike-san. You know, we don't have to, we should avoid, you know, Chinese uh, getting free ride and getting uh, information as, as much as possible so that uh, they can make use of the latest uh, information to cultivate their policy. At the same time, they don't have any obligation at all. That kind of situation is something that we should avoid. But uh, it's really difficult. But uh, perhaps uh, maybe we can ask kind of membership fee, <laughs> even for the observer. So like once uh, you know, they um, just uh, be there, that they have to also be a part of some kind of uh, commitment. So it's of course difficult, but uh, I totally agree with some kind of concerns, just like uh, making, uh, you know, inviting China as observers, and then just uh, they have freedom of not, you know, committing something, but getting information. That's a really, uh, uh, you know, important thing we should consider. Um, at this moment, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. So let's now go over to uh, Akiko Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, Micah, thank you very much for your terrific comments and uh, tough questions. Uh, first on uh, subsea cables and 5G networks and beyond. Uh, as you pointed out, there are countries who are in very bad need for proper subsea cables uh, between Europe and Asia, whether we call it Indo-Pacific or uh, other uh, way, I think they really need it. And uh, China has been providing it through uh, their digital Silk Road uh, initiative. And uh, I think it is important for us, Europe, Japan, and the United States, and for that matter, other like-minded countries to 
form an alliance, if I may put it that way, uh, and offer uh, proposals for these uh, digital connectivity infrastructure. Before, I didn't know, but I have learned that subsea cables carry 95% of international data traffic. 5% is by satellites. I thought the reverse. And this shows how important subsea cables are for uh, data flow. So for that, I wonder whether uh, partnership agreement or other uh, instruments can be used to offer uh, subsea cables and 5Gs to countries who need those very badly. And I have a concern, as I said, uh, the way uh, subsea cables are offered to some countries in need uh, in, as, as a kind of a package with landing stations and other uh, terrestrial uh, equipments, there should be some rules uh, that we all uh, respect. And this brings me to the question about uh, global standards, rules, and regulations. I said global because such uh, standards or regulations or whatever you put it uh, should be global. That means it should include uh, China as well. The options might be one, to have double standards, double meaning one by China and the other by uh, Europe, uh, US, Japan, and others. And that's the thing I would not like to see. Uh, rather, I would like to see a global one. And here I would like, I expect a lot to European initiative. Europe has such a high reputation as well as a brilliant history of setting uh, standards and rules and regulations or norm setting. And that's something I would like to expect from Europe in digital connectivity as well. Uh, Michael San, as well as uh, the chair of Hetman, has asked, where are we going to discuss these standards and regulations and rules? And that's a very good question. I don't have a brilliant uh, response to that, but uh, I think we have to work on the issue from uh, a variety of perspectives. WTO definitely uh, needs to discuss this uh, in the context of e-commerce. And I understand uh, with the new leader at the top of the WTO, they have started to discuss uh, data flow with uh, data free flow with trust as well as uh, e-commerce. And I hope uh, that will go uh, farther and also uh, e I wonder whether European Union and Japan can lead uh, this discussion as we uh, uh, put an emphasis on human-centered approach of protection of people's dignity and uh, involve United States and other like-minded countries. Uh, my cousin has referred to Quad, uh, Quad uh, Summit meeting held uh, uh, last week online. And as uh, my cousin has pointed out, Quad uh, leaders have agreed to start uh, four or expert uh, workshops. Included in it is uh, new technology. And of course, digital is included. I have asked the content of it, but it seems it is going to be worked out in future. So while it is in the making, uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, ask uh, and uh, uh, encourage uh, Quad members to look into digital uh, as well. And uh, Foreign Minister Motegi explained that Quad uh, is going to work on these agenda, but uh, in uh, cooperation with others. For example, that vaccine was the major topic of Quad this time, but uh, Foreign Minister Motegi emphasized that he is going to uh, relate with COVAX facility and other global facilities in order to make it uh, effective. So that might be another way to uh, look at it. Digital connectivity is such a complicated issue, and I hope uh, uh, Michael san and I and others who are interested in the topic can cross-fertilize our ideas 
here as well as beyond so that we can come up with uh, some sort of a solution or a way forward for this issue. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I uh, must confess that I have not been encouraging people to prepare to ask questions because I assume that was kind of understood. But anyway, the floor uh, is open. Um, so please use the, uh, the chat function uh, if you have questions to pose uh, to the panelists. I know that Marie wants to come back in. So I'll give the floor back to Marie. But in the meanwhile, if you could, uh, in, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and direct them at the relevant panelists mm. or all of the panelists um, as, you, as you prefer. Mm. Uh, Marie. Yes, I just wanted to get back as, actually to Watanabe-san's statement <laughs> about China having a win-win approach and a top-down one concerning development cooperation. Uh, I it just have to point out that who is the biggest provider of development cooperation to China during all years? namely Japan. And what China is doing now is to a certain extent mimicking what Japan was doing in Southeast Asia from the 1970s and onward. Japan is the expert on large economic infrastructure projects and loan aid and uh, at that time top down and still Japanese aid to a large extent, this project or oriented and very few, um, very little money going to through NGOs and that kind of project. So it's we can't blame China and Europe has another part, pattern, which is not that good either. So uh, we shouldn't look at China, as you say, as something very, very special. It has been very close to Japanese development cooperation and the way it's been done from Japan. And this is uh, an approach which is now gaining support in the world because money is needed. And then it becomes like this, which is both bad and good parts. It's no uh, almost giving any longer, <laughs> but uh, developing countries should also take their part. And I don't think we should divide the world into uh, Europe taking care of Africa and uh, uh, Japan in Southeast Asia. We should actually cooperate. This is uh, my main point. EU and Japan should, of course, cooperate, but we should be in a multilateral setting, letting others in as well, including China or including other countries like Canada and US and, and so forth. This is important, I think. Another thing, uh, getting back to Akiko's statement, in uh, standards in digital technology, of course, very important. But I would say standard setting for industry in general is a huge topic where EU and Japan should cooperate. Thank you. Thanks. So I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so let me ask something that on, on, on my side. So one of the things that really struck me also in, in terms of Micah's comments, and we've had a bit of discussion on, you know, China as an observer, essentially free riding on the exchange of information that is given by, by other donor countries. But also Marie's emphasis on um, starting with actually figuring out what recipient countries want, right? What the priorities are, and I think there's a there's a link to be made between those two dimensions in terms of filling this information and transparency gap. Because um, I think, I mean, my 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 sense would be there's a real need for much more coordination uh, in terms of identifying and dealing with priorities. I think the EU approach of thinking a bit more regionally than necessarily just national and project specific is a good one, but you've got to connect the dots. And, and it seems to me from the presentations on what is happening in different areas is there's, there's really a huge lack of communication between the various players that are trying to fill the connectivity gap. And that connectivity gap, as all of you have emphasized, is absolutely huge uh, in developing countries. So 
that to me is, is really one of the big challenges, but it's also a huge opportunity. Um, so maybe a question to all of you is, you know, we're all very much obsessed with China as in terms of the geopolitics, in terms of the values, clearly we don't share the same values. But on the other hand, you could argue there is a huge area in which we do have shared values or appear to have shared values in terms of trying to improve infrastructure and trying to improve the lives of people who are going to be using that infrastructure, companies in these countries that can then benefit from having better access to both hard and digital types of infrastructure. So it does come back to this, I think, missing element in terms of international cooperation, where I would imagine that the EU and the US you know, could agree that we really need to try and deal with this. Now, this is, of course, an age old problem in terms of certainly development assistance, but I think maybe having a few kind of thoughts thrown out, and uh, you probably haven't thought about this very deeply, but <laughs> I do would like to throw it back at you and say, okay, so what could be some concrete steps we could take led by EU Japan to actually deal with that kind of transparency information prioritization problem? Because I think also some of the things that were mentioned by you in terms of problems with the BRI approach really has to start with empowering the recipient countries to actually understand what they can do if projects are no longer financially sustainable. You know, what is your legal recourse? What's the experience of other countries? So of course, there's a huge amount to get of knowledge around the world and how you might deal and should be dealing with those problems. So anyway, I think maybe some, we have four minutes left. So maybe some final thoughts on kind of how we might deal with this issue. Who wants to start? <laughs> I, I, I saw Micah and I saw Marie and I saw Shino. So yeah. just if I may very briefly add to your question also um, some reflections on what are the key international institutions where EU Japan better coordination might also help to bring you know a certain groups of countries more to uh, to to agree with some of the, uh, um, the issues that the EU and Japan are pushing for. Um, countries that may now be siding uh, with, with China more for, for various reasons. Okay, let me, before you step in, there is one question that has come in from the chat. I think you all have access to the chat. So have a look at that. How does the panel respond to the notion that EU and US have diametrically different positions on telecom infrastructure? Um, so have a look at that and then I'll go back to, um, to the panel. So Marie, you want to start? Yeah, I, I got confused by the, <laughs> <laughs> so, by the chat, but let me... Um, so while uh, you speak, the other two can read the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think uh, exchange of personnel is actually very important. In, in various organizations uh, to create a network between EU, Japan, people in the, in the banking industry, in the development cooperation industry. Very few uh, Europeans know very much about JICA and what JICA is doing, except the ones on the ground where they can cooperate at some points. But go send them to the head office in Tokyo <laughs> and uh, send the uh, Japanese people to, to uh, the INTPA, International Partnership, the Director General of International Partnership in the EU and talk with them and then let them be there for a while and exchange ideas. I think this has an enormous power. And that's also my answer to Mike. That's one of the places where ideas could be exchanged actually. Banking is the same. Why don't we invite some JIBIC bankers into the European Investment Bank and the other way around? <laughs> exchange of people means exchange of ideas and it's, usually gets very good results. We have the knowledge and the power to do this. So we should profit from that. And that, that's a very <laughs> pragmatic suggestion. <laughs> yeah. so, Shino san uh, thank you very much uh, for very interesting uh, questions and points. I just want to make one point. Uh, it's about uh, uh, China's uh, participation uh, in like um, 
you know, OECD or DAC or those like uh, institutional level, of course, uh, in a sense, we are successful uh, encouraging uh, China to be observers. At the same time, what is missing or what we should do more is at the kind of ground level in recipient countries, uh, there has been donor coordination going on. But at the same time, uh, European countries are very good at leading that kind of opportunities. And of course, uh, Japan, JICA uh, participate in that kind of framework. But unfortunately, as far as I know, uh, in like a Southeast Asian countries, Chinese participation of donor coordination in recipient country has been still limited. So in this regard, perhaps um, we can encourage China to join and coordinate at the grassroots level. And then like, uh, we can you know, appreciate uh, Chinese like, money uh, coming into recipient countries so that uh, you know, China can definitely help uh, build like, infrastructure needed by the local community. So in that sense, like, I definitely encourage Chinese to join donor coordination, both at the you know, international institution at the same time more in like recipient countries. I think that's a kind of easy step for China. It doesn't take any money. And just like a, coming to a kind of a donor meeting, if perhaps after the you know, COVID-19 you know, crisis will be over, but still, you know, just a face-to-face -face communication matters a lot. Great, thank you. Also, again, a very pragmatic uh, suggestion. So I think it actually works out very nicely because the question was really on the topic that uh, Akiko Sar was speaking to. So you will have the last word. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for the question to the chat box as well. As uh, Dr. Makiyama has pointed out, uh, there are so many uh, difficult phases in uh, digital connect connectivity. And we often uh, have this debate, uh, inclusion or exclusion. But um, I would like to emphasize that uh, we should consider the ultimate uh, beneficiary of connectivity, that's people. And I would like to emphasize human-centered approach is absolutely necessary in considering digital connectivity, be it for standard setting, rules setting, or provision of uh, assistance to countries who uh, need those uh, equipment and infrastructure. If we lose sight of this ultimate goal of human-centered approach, uh, we may fail and end up discussing exclusion and inclusion once again. That's my view. And I hope uh, we will have another opportunity to uh, cross fertilize our ideas on this difficult question of connectivity, including digital connectivity. Thank you. Okay, we've reached the end of our time. So I'd like to thank all of you for really interesting presentations. And I think what are going to be very interesting papers. And I look forward to, well, at some point, seeing you in the flesh somewhere, hopefully in Florence <laughs> and otherwise online in the coming sessions of this conference. So thanks again, and um, we'll leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs>